Now, the last section of Article 110 that we're going to go over in the lecture material is going to be the concept of guarding against accidental contact and protecting electrical equipment. Just this general idea of this over a few different sections. So the general concept here is that the NEC wants us to both protect personnel from accidentally touching equipment or being able to be exposed to live equipment and also we want to protect that equipment from damage from the environment that it's exposed to. This is again somewhat reflected in our first little section here 110.27 part A where it tells us that live parts of electrical equipment operating at 50 to 1000 volts nominal shall be guarded against accidental contact by approved enclosures or by any of the following means. So we either have to have an equipment in an enclosure to protect people from touching it, or essentially we have to guard or have it in a specific location where it's inaccessible. Uh, so in breaking down those two other options, we can see number one here, by location, in a room vault or similar enclosure, uh, and I'm going to group that together by with number three, by location on a balcony, gallery, or platform elevated. And number four, by elevations above the floor or other work surface. So that would be our kind of location requirements. And then we can see number two here, by permanent substantial partitions or screens arranged so that only qualified persons have access to the space within reach of the live parts. Uh, so for this, you may think, although this isn't the same thing, just as a reference, you may think uh, a gate around an electrical substation uh, as being protection against that. Now, typically, though, I'll say that we are going to be looking at enclosures to protect equipment, and the NEC gives us some specific requirements for those enclosures if we're using an, enclo an enclosure for electrical equipment. The requirements for this are laid out somewhat in 110.26 for enclosure tops. So we see that enclosures of switchboard, switchgear, panel boards, control panels, etc., etc., if we move on through the list, rated not over a thousand volts nominal and intended for such locations shall be marked with an enclosure top number as shown in table 110.28. Again, we have another table. We see table 110.28 shall be used for selecting these enclosures for use in specific locations other than hazardous classified locations. Uh, with hazardous classified locations being those referred to uh, in Articles 500, 501, 502, and 503 of the NEC, which are essentially explosive situations, uh, uh, scenarios in which we have a risk of uh, explosions due to fumes or vapors and things of that nature. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at Table 110.28 and discuss it because it's a very important table to understand. So if we move down slightly or to our next page, and we can see that we have table 110.28 here for enclosure selection. So anytime that we're looking to pick what type of enclosure we want to use to protect electrical equipment or to install electrical equipment in, this would be our reference for that. Now, the way table 110.28 works is we can see we have one half of the table for outdoor use and one table for indoor use. Now again, as we previously mentioned with tables and understanding our columns and rows, we see our first column is provide a degree of protection against the following conditions. So in other words, will the enclosure protect against this item? So we can see examples like rain, snow, and sleet, hose down, corrosive agents, so on and so forth. And then our next column is the enclosure type number, and we have a list of numbers for the enclosure, and these are referred to as a NEMA enclosure top. You can look up more information on these, what these enclosures actually are uh, through NEMA, and there are other enclosures that NEMA has that are not listed in this table. But these are going to be the main NEMA tops that we'll be using for the vast majority of electrical installations. So let's move to the indoor section and look at a very standard type of enclosure, which would be an enclosure type 1, a NEMA 1 enclosure. So based on the X's we can see here, we can see that a NEMA 1 enclosure provides protection against incidental contact with the enclosed equipment 
and fallen dirt, but nothing else. If we were to look at comparison of a 4X enclosure, another common type of enclosure, we see that it offers the same protection as a NEMA 1, but has all of these additional protection types uh, that are listed for the 4X enclosure. We can even see amongst all the enclosure types for indoor enclosures, a 4X and a 6P are the only enclosures that protect against corrosive agents. So essentially, it's our job as the electrical uh, professional uh, or the electrical installer that we have to coordinate what type of enclosure we're going to need based on what type of environmental conditions we're installing them in. So again, the first step of that would be to determine are we indoor or outdoor, and then to identify what type of conditions that we're going to be looking at. You know, are there corrosive agents in the environment? Is it going to be subject to hose down or water? Uh, is there going to is it going to need to be submersed for some reason? Uh, and other things. Now again, there's some verbiage down here below the table that would is good to familiarize yourself with. So, for instance, rain tight being in conjunction with types 3, 3S, 3SX, so on and so forth. Water top being used in conjunction with enclosures type 4, 4X, and 6. And finally, dust top being used in conjunction with enclosure types 3, 3S, 3SX, and again, so on and so forth. Uh, so, again, these are just informational notes that are intended to assist you. And we can see here, the way I have this table marked up uh, is more just for reference and information's sake. These would be the most common types of enclosures that you're going to be working with in general industry. Now, as always, if you're working in a very specialized industry, and that's the only type of work that you do, so for instance, maybe a oil refinery type installation or nuclear power, uh, or again, just a general specialty industry, rather than a variety of buildings, you may all the time be using one of these enclosure types that I don't have highlighted. But again, for the vast majority of building types, these are going to be your common enclosures that you'll see. Now, aside from enclosures, one of the things that we previously referenced, as we can see, are vaults uh, or other similar enclosures. In addition to regular enclosures, the NEC does give us some provisions for vaults that we have to meet as well and consider. Now, this does cross over into part three for over 1,000 volts nominal that we're going to be looking at. However, uh, these are general requirements for vaults themselves to, again, to consider. And we're just going to briefly go over those. So we can see part A for electrical vaults, which is broken down from 11031A1 to A5. Generally speaking, a level of fire rating uh, and fire prevention is what the code's going to be looking for. And that's kind of reflected in these areas. So we can see that for the walls and roof, they have to be constructed of a material that has adequate strength for the conditions and has a minimum fire rating of three hours. We can see that any doors that lead into the vault have to be provided with a door that has a minimum fire rating of three hours. We can see that the floors of the vault, if they're in contact with the earth, have to be concrete, not less than four inches thick, or otherwise, it has to have a minimum fire resistance of three hours. And as a general note for vaults, we can see that any doors on those vaults have to be equipped with a lock, and they have to be kept locked with access only be provided to qualified person, persons. And again, these are just some general requirements for vaults that we see that tie back to our enclosure times. So as mentioned, this is going to be our last lecture that we do to cover Article 110 since we covered the main parts. There are some other parts to generally be aware of with Article 110. Uh, so we can see that Essentially, we have a repeat of most of these sections, such as the working depth and whatnot, for once we cross over to our 1,000 volts nominal and up. And we can also see that we have part 4 for tunnel insulations over 1,000 volts. And we have part 5 for manholes and other electrical enclosures intended for personnel entry. Now again, these are going to be often less referenced sections of Article 110. Again, we've covered most of our main cover points in Article 110 here.
as a general recap of that, also very briefly here at the end of the video, uh, we started off with our general requirements of Article 110 for conductor terminations uh, and general equipment considerations, which then moved us into our termination temperature provisions that tie into Article uh, 310 and Table 310.16. Uh, we then moved over to our labels and warnings required by Article 110 and other identifiers that we have to have, again, generally for electrical equipment, such as the uh, available fault current, the arc flash hazard warnings, and so on. We moved into working space requirements, as well as dedicated space requirements with the height, width, and depths, the egress, sliding, so on and so forth. And then finally, we discussed different types of enclosures and how to protect against uh, accidental contact, whether it be by location or by physical guards, uh, with the main point of that being Table 110.28. So again, that covers the major parts of Article 110, what we're going to want to know from there in most installations. However, again, just be aware those other sections are there if you do get asked a question in which you may have to reference them.